Andrew, Friday again. It's Friday again, Friday, November the 27th. Um, and uh, we have discovered something important this week. Not only is capitalism deformed, Keith, but it's it's deformation, if there's such a word, uh, has been caused by your friends, the venture capitalists. So um, why, <laughs> why is capitalism deformed and, and, and what have the venture capitalists done to ruin it so much? Well, so here's, here's the, uh, the newsletter uh, lead this week, um, and it comes from a New Yorker article. Um, uh, here's, the, here's one of the, the key quotes from the article. Even the worst run startup can beat competitors if investors prop it up. The VC firm Benchmark helped enable WeWork to make one wild mistake after another, hoping that its gamble would pay off before disaster struck. Which is kind of an interesting quote. Um, it's a long piece in the New Yorker, and the headline by Charles Duhigg, who's um, a best-selling author and also a New York Times writer. So. It's kind of interesting because it's a BuzzFeed style headline because actually the article is mainly about WeWork and they've taken a, a clickbait headline, How Venture Capitalists Are Deforming Capitalism. And, um, it, you know, it's a simple point. Um, he's making the point that if you have enough money uh, and you throw it at something, you can make it work. Funnily enough, his article is proving the opposite, that no matter how much money you throw at a bad idea, it, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure. I mean, firstly, WeWork is an interesting case where, and I'm not saying I told you so, but it seemed to me at the time that it was clearly a scam because there's no way it could ever work. It, it reminded me of Enron. I think it's the closest thing to Enron, and the guy in charge was somewhat like Enron. I'm sure he yeah. was in jail. You know, in my venture work, a, the, in the work I do in venture, there's a religion, and the religion's called Unit Economics. And unit economics is the measure of whether something can be profitable um, and at scale. And yeah, you're right. We work never had or ever could have had good unit economics. That said, to, um, to, to accuse venture capital of deforming capitalism due to that investment makes it appear as if that's a typical case. And I think, you know, in venture capital, given that nine out of every... 10 investments fail. Um, there's lots of failure. But the truth is, there's also lots of Teslas. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, and Tesla a year ago seemed in some ways like we worked. Well, te Tesla always had great unit economics, but it was making a loss in order to grow. Mm. That's the difference. Yeah. If you grow something that can't be profitable, you just make a loss forever. I think but what this piece shows is the power of superstardom you you need the uh, who's the we works guy the neumann what's his name i think it's neumann or something yeah adam neumann um and it also focuses on one particularly seemingly erudite anglo vc is it benchmark who um contributed to the the the, the myth of, of of we works so here's my question on we works can vent venture capitalists back a losing proposition like we works and still make money um there's a lot of variables in the we works where most of the money that went down the the toilet so to speak i mean did that come from uh, asia it came from masayoshi's son from softbank most recently but there were yeah, pre, there the were prior left, investors left holding the bag right when the music stopped well, he's done an interesting thing. He's marked WeWork down from its peak to currently $2.9 billion of valuation. And he's, um, he's cleaning house in that he's trying to redirect the model to something that does have positive unit economics. Uh, he's prepared to take a major write-off, but in doing so, he also owns most of the company now. And... Um, as he builds it back up, I wouldn't rule out that he will make good money from it. What do you think of um, the other potential WeWorks around? I mean, Uber comes to mind in the sense that, 
I still think there's a book or a movie or, or, or certainly a long article about all the people who invested in the angel round at Uber. They made so much money. And, um, and, and, and it's still not clear, even though Prop 22 passed in, in California, it's still not clear that Uber is a viable company. So I, I think Uber is closer to Amazon, if you think of it abstractly as a bundle of value. Um, Amazon, if you look at the amount of money Amazon has lost over the decades, um, in order to get as big as it is, it's, it's a large sum. Now, mo most of the money it spent came from its own revenues in, in, in recent yeah. years, or from bonds. Uh, putting bonds into the market and selling them and, and using debt. So its equity has actually become very valuable uh, because of that. And I think Uber, you know, ultimately, because it doesn't employ drivers or buy cars, it basically takes 30% of every ride. And it's mainly a software company should be highly profitable at the unit economics level. Unlike, say, WeWork, which has to buy buildings or Open Door. Yeah, WeWork's the other end of the thing. I guess the difference between Uber and Amazon is Bezos versus Kalalnik. Um, and, and Bezos has always managed to um, uh, to be a you know hero genius type, whereas Kalalnik is smart and dynamic, but also has an element of the criminal in him which ultimately cost him right right and i guess uh Kalanick's much closer to to newman or neumann at uh at we work well he he spent a lot of money on non-core elements of uber like like self-driving car r d for example i um, mean you're an insider so for you it's less shocking and i'm a semi-insider but for ordinary people, people who aren't in the community, who aren't in tech, there is something very troubling about this, is that VCs throw, you know, tens, hundreds, maybe even billions of dollars at a, an idea like WeWorks, which clearly couldn't work and was self-evidently, if not fraudulent, profoundly problematic. It's definitely not fraudulent. I mean... If you think well, about I mean, there's it, there's an element of fraud in the sense that the whole thing got going in the first place when, as you say, it couldn't really work. Well, if you if you modeled it out, what I do with startups is I model them out. If yeah, you model it out, out you say, okay, okay my rent on this building is $50,000 a month and there's 300 desks. And if I could rent 50% of the desks at, you know, $1,000 a month, then I'm going to have a gross margin. Uh, Open Door does the same. Uh, Open Door buys and sells houses, and they sold five billion dollars worth of houses last year. But their gross margin was 1.9 percent. So basically, um, there are businesses which might work at scale. You need, you have to model them out, and you then you have to, you well, know, anyone can model them out. All you got to do is have a computer right i mean that's uh, yeah but then you've got to do the work then you've got to get the buildings but negotiate as this the article shows uh, which is a very well i mean whether or not you agree with it, it's very well written and very readable um it was neumann the sort of charismatic uh founder who convinced everyone who, who who's spellbinding i mean he's he's got the kalalnik or the bezos quality of conv and, and obviously Steve Jobs of convincing people that what couldn't be true actually is true. It's not. I'll, I'll be honest. It, it you know. And remember, I, I've been responsible for raises of close to a billion dollars in my career, and uh, clearly you have to sell and tell a story when you do that. It, there's no way you're going to be able to do that unless you're charismatic and can tell a story. But you also have to have an economic model that, when converted into reality, produces um, value. And I, I, I think my experience is most VCs do a really good job of filtering out things that will lose money. So I'm going to guess, and I haven't seen it, there must have been an economic model at the core of WeWork that was believable to smart people. 
Um, I don't I don't know what that spreadsheet was, but well, it's I, always the case. In retrospect, it seems dumb, but you know, Enron had a model. WeWorks have a model. I mean, you can always come up with a model. You can always. I always think the numbers are yeah are the most I'm, fictional thing in any presentation. You can always bend the numbers. You can always bring them down or bring them up or whatever you need to do to make a profit. Yeah, but you as the entrepreneur, which I mean, you'll do this for Now TV. Um, you as an entrepreneur can tell whether the model is something you're comfortable executing or not. Um, you, you know, so uh, it's pretty hard to fake it, to be honest, unless you're a sociopath. Because I think the VCs do have, if not a moral problem, certainly a, a PR problem in the way they're perceived by other people. In the same way, Silicon Valley has a bit of. I, I, I think I that's true. Is a, he's not some sort of left wing. He's not. He's not. Um, you know, a, a, a Bernie bro. He's a mainstream, best-selling author, uh, and one who mostly writes about business and insight and, and, and intuition. I mean, his yeah, but his, his his ability to determine does that give him the ability to determine the quality of an investment more than say. Um, the benchmark capital partner that's mentioned throughout the article. No, but I don't think he's trying to do that. He's simply telling a story in this piece. I mean, in, in the sense that he's ex he's revealing to people the the absurd story of WeWorks of an idea, as you acknowledge, that wasn't viable. They raised hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars. It was worth many billions, and then it all came crashing down, and someone was left holding the bag. Yeah, I but wonder they... what. Um, in just as uh, most journalists don't like VCs, most VCs don't like journalists. I wonder what our friend Paul Graham would say about all this, Keith. Funny you should say that, Andrew. Um, this is this <laughs> this is breaking news because it's it's just happened. But let's let's. Um, oh, what a coincidence! This is Paul and Graham. It's not a coincidence. Paul Graham sounding off about the New York Times, uh, along oh, with, by the way. Uh, along with Joe Lonsdale and a couple of a couple of VCs and Mike Larrington, all making negative points about uh, mainstream media, and uh, Gabe Rivera, the founder of TechMeme, down below, making the point that the New York Times has now hit seven million subscribers uh, digitally. So, um, whereas Paul Graham is predicting the demise of mainstream media. Gabe is um, uh, uh, highlighting the success, at least of the New York Times. So what is it about people like your friend Paul Graham that brings out their distrust and dislike of, of traditional journalists, Keith? Why don't they like them? I don't think I don't think Paul Graham is really a marketer at his core. He's a he's a he's a coder, an engineer. And um, you know when you when when you've done startups successfully, you understand that you need to leverage the media. Um, uh, of course, the media changes all the time, but the New York Times is a go-to place to get them to write about whatever it is you're doing. As is the Wall Street Journal, as is the Economist, and so on and so forth. And I think engineers, at their core, don't understand marketing as and, and how it contributes to success. Well, they're just that, very thin skin. They don't like to be criticized. They don't like to read anything that in any way doesn't confirm their often bizarre view of the world. Well, I, I, it's also true, Andrew, that when you're an entrepreneur and an innovator, by nature, you're doing things that no one understands yet. And so you get a lot of negativity from smart status quo believers. Um, disbelief is the norm, and that is incredibly frustrating for somebody trying to change the world. Right. I mean, if if I if I had a really brilliant idea that changed the nature of everything, I would actually want big media to write against it because that would confirm my yeah. revolutionary idea. There would be nothing more annoying than people on the New York Times who got what I was trying to do, then it wouldn't be very interesting. No, I've, I've been there. I agree with you. I, when I did Real Names, there was all these articles saying Keith T is trying to destroy the internet by inventing keywords to replace URLs. Um, and I, I loved it because any normal person would much prefer keywords to URLs. <laughs> and then that was the thing about WeWork, is it wasn't even a revolutionary idea. 
I mean, it was such a stupid idea that they would buy up all the real estate. Well, it's, and I it, would always ask people, where's the value? Oh, they own all this real estate. What could be more absurd than a, a, a next generation company that was buying up New York commercial real estate? Well, Open Door's doing the same now with residential real estate. Are you suggesting that Open Door's a bit of a scam as well? Oh, it's, it's not a scam, but it's a thin margin flipping business. Uh, where well, that's WeWork a couldn't light way of saying it's a scam, probably. No, but no, they're not going to have the same. Open Door's not going to have the same fate as WeWork. No, Open Door is is run run very well. It makes money. Um, it's just that it has to do a lot of sales to make a small amount of money. Well, let's move on from the defamation of capitalism. Another of your suggested pieces this week, Keith. Um, argues that it's not capitalism that's deformed, it's civilization itself. So it's a pretty dark picture you're painting this week. What's going on with that? Yeah, so this is uh, the Atlantic. It's interesting this week. It's the New Yorker and the Atlantic dominating. Mainstream uh, journalists, those evil people. So this is, this is a very compelling, dark piece where uh, Graham Wood uh, uh, interviews a guy called Peter Turkin. A Russian, appropriate. Only a Russian could be that dark. I mean, he's, not literally he, dark, but... He's a Russian and he's a professor in, in Connecticut um, at the university there. And he's a specialist in modeling civilizations. Um, so he, he ties mathematics and statistics to society. He's a kind he's, of geeky Jared Diamond. Is geeky. He started life in his PhD studying beetles, not not the Liverpool variety, but the bug variety. And um, he was able to predict population changes and shifts, and he's applied it to human civilization and has come up with, 10 years ago actually, predicted that 2020 would be a terrible year, which it has turned out to be true. And then yeah, another no, result is become a bit of a celebrity. Right, he didn't. No one predicted. He didn't predict COVID in 2020. I mean, no, but 2020 he, has been bad. It's because of COVID. He didn't say why. He just said it would be bad. And now, you know, know. Um, chan as chance would have it, um, you know, if you probably like if you, Mr. WeWorks, another fraud, Keith. It's probably a fraud, and uh, I put it in because it's a really great read, and yeah. the writer is buying to some extent the the narrative What's the thesis then i mean it, it's not about covid why does he suggest we're heading for the um actually it's, it's it's an intelligent thesis the thesis is that and this you'll you'll relate to this very well you'll probably disagree with it but elites are overproduced in society as society gets better and there isn't enough good work for the elites to do so the second level elite will start to turn on the top level elite yeah. and create social conflict, including violence, possibly a civil war, as different parts of the elite fight each other. And that makes sense in what we've just talked about, because New York Times journalists are definitely second tier compared to the Paul Grahams and the benchmark capital VCs of the world. So there is a, I think in some ways he's right, there is an intellectual civil war brewing between uh, it's not Republicans versus Democrats. I think it's a civil war within the Democratic Party or within the mainstream. Yeah, well, and media community and within the Republican Party. I mean, I don't know if you saw that guy with the megaphone in Atlanta last week saying um, uh, to a large crowd uh, to the Republican Party, if you're not supporting us. Actually, it was in, yeah, it was in Georgia. If you're not supporting us challenging the results of this election in Georgia, then we're not going to be supporting you, Republican Party. And it, it, so the schism between uh, uh, you know what looked like blue-collar Republicans, pro-Trump, and the core um, establishment of the Republican Party is is plain for all to see. And so I, if this guy's tr if if he's if he's right, which he may be, that. The problem with the world of the 2020s is that we're not producing enough jobs for the elite, so there's going to be civil war. It's a sort of it's 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 the argument that was made before correctly the French and the Russian and the Chinese revolutions. Do you think VCs have 
a moral, I don't know, using the word moral responsibility with VCs is, is slightly chilling, but do they have a degree of responsibility to invest in companies that might try to fix some of this stuff? Well, there's, a, you know, venture only has one responsibility to return money to its investors. And there that are is a moral responsibility, Keith, as well. You know, people, they're not going to invest in eugenics companies. They're not going to invest. In I, stuff that's honestly, really I think on the, on, on the fringe, I think you're, you're right. There are lines, but they did invest in Jewel, for example. Um, so the moral responsibility is definitely trumped by the financial one. Um, it's quite interesting. Yeah, if you... and it definitely is important in terms of AI because still the biggest issue on the, on the horizon for tech and society is the automat or the the automa uh, the, the the automation of work, which obviously touches on what this guy's saying. Yeah. And actually, COVID has compounded that. I just read a piece in the in in the journal today about how the uh, how COVID has essentially destroyed the prospects of. Of, of all all university kids who graduated in 2020 this is going to be a whole generation that have been wounded you know the next generation of mussolini's or hitler's or lenin's or stalin interesting enough there is an opponent that the atlantic quotes i'll, I'll put it up this is um again an american professor with a chinese background disagreeing and making the point that human beings are much more complicated than beetles and that um, humans pull ideological power moves all the time. Um, and you know, for a natural scientist to be able to incorporate the myriad complexity of human strategy, emotion, and belief um, basically is impossible. So he, he's making the point that ev even if the model was correct and therefore the results of the model are believable, human beings are clever enough to figure out how to not do things that it's predicted they will do. And not all the news this week is bad, Keith, in spite of the fact that some people are writing about a deformed capitalism or the end of Western civilization. There are still Silicon Valley investors, entrepreneurs who are pretty cheerful, who actually see the events in November as reason to be cheerful. Um, one in particular, an, an, a nice tech crunch piece that you picked out. Oh, the, 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 uh, social media echo chambers piece do you mean yes yeah that that's um i thought it was it was a very interesting it's written by bernard moon who i don't know who uh, is a friend of mine he's a a silicon valley based uh, uh venture capitalist with a focus on on korea he has a korean he's a korean american he's a really nice guy so he 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 makes the point the same point actually as the chinese professor which is that um, uh, you know there was all the, uh, there were all these fears that um, there'd be a civil war when Trump lost, uh, and all of his gun-toting supporters would take to the streets in militias, and uh, it was all over social media, but it was also over mainstream media. It, wa it wasn't just social media. So um, uh, Mr. Moon here is making the point that there's that that uh, pundits and intellectuals and politicians. Um, uh, 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 and social media doesn't constitute truth, that human beings are way smarter than... Well, we, knew, we certainly knew that. Now, yeah. We didn't need Bernard Moon to tell us that, but he does, he does remind us that, you know, a month ago, everyone had all these dire predictions of civil war, of the, uh, you know, people on the streets, both left and right, killing each other. And none of that's happened. I mean, I have to, I, I, I predicted that none of this would happen because I just think, especially the Republican, uh, the, the right wing of the Republican Party are, are all mouth. They sit at home doing, uh, doing their social media, but they're not really willing to fight. Had Trump won or had he managed to pull off, you know, had, it, had the margins been really tight and he'd managed to destroy the, the voting system, I think you would have had violence. Now, I will throw it back to you, Andrew. You, you, you're a pretty strong advocate of the dangers of social media. And in a way, he's making the point that it's less dangerous than you think because human beings are more intelligent than we give them credit for. Well, he's making the point that there is a center that is a sort of unspoken center and that everyone who's talking about 
these divisions goes on social media, they go on Parley or Twitter or Facebook to prove their case. But most people aren't part of that world, which I think he's right on. Very good. So any other, what's the big tech news this week, Keith, leaving aside politics and the end of civilization, anything really happening? Uh, nothing major. Uh, you know. No, uh, no safe harbor stuff. I saw an interesting piece on safe harbor changing everything, although we keep on having those. Yeah, no, I mean, um, the, the newsletter this week, which is random because it, 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 it's the stuff that stands out from what I read in the week, um, is all big thinking. Maybe it's the Thanksgiving reflection moment, but... After um, a big meal. Yeah, you have... Uh, we don't have anything from uh, Paul Graham, but we do have something from one of your other heroes, Elad Gill, the unusual signs of a billion dollar company. He shouldn't be let le he shouldn't be telling everyone that because now we all know it. What, what, what are these unusual signs? Um, well, th this is a this is a discussion with uh, another really interesting guy called James Courier. J James is uh, at a VC firm called NFX, which is quite different. Uh, to most VC firms, it's building a venture platform with great information and applications for funding. It's doing a lot of interesting stuff. And Elad Gill is the num is in the top five performing angel investors um, ever. So th th it's a conversation between the two of them, and they're really focusing in on um, on the founder as the best signal of what will happen. It's the opposite of the uh, Neumann point, um, because well, I accept that if you believe Neumann, then the, the, the founder is everything. I mean, they invest. You invest in people rather than ideas. Isn't that fair? Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. It is fair. Um, and and anyway, they they they're looking at all the things which signal that a company is is um, is going to be a, a future unicorn. Now. They go into things like the addressable market, uh, what the definition of the startup is, what the future growth might be through a model, um, and so on and so forth. So it's quite detailed. I'm, I can't repeat it all here, but it's very good thinking. And these are two of the very best minds when it comes to this. So if you're a founder and you want to sell your company to an investor as an investment, understanding this conversation will 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 impact the way you tell your story big time what about the tweet of the week this week keith the tweet of the week is uh here i actually had time to put it on screen um it is the former head of the sec acknowledging that uh, uh he's still the chairman by the way but the assumption is he's going to move on He's set, making the point that uh, they do not consider Bitcoin to be a security and therefore they cannot regulate it. Um, and it, 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 uh, more positively, they, they see it as a payment mechanism and a store of value. Um, now, I've chosen it as the tweet of the week because those comments coming out of the mouth of a blockchain enthusiast would be completely normal. But coming from the chairman of the SEC, they're profound and significant for the future of value storage, and uh, uh, probably not payments. I think he's wrong about payments. But doesn't it confirm what we're already seeing with companies like PayPal allowing people to, ordinary people, uh, to, to trade with crypto? Yep, and Square, Square Cash, um, and Robin Hood, by the way, uh, my my 13 year old has $200 worth of bitcoin in a robin hood account um my 19 year old has like $1000 of bitcoin in a robin hood account uh so it's it's become very easy bitcoin is now at $17000 uh that's down 2000 over the last couple of days it went as high as 19000 and um it, it, its market capitalization is larger now than it was at the peak of the bubble two years ago. And that's why it's your startup of the week, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is is indeed... Is it a startup, though? I mean, no one owns Bitcoin. Um, you know, Maybe think, of it, 
think of it as um let, let's put this on screen this is um sorry. this is um visual capitalist which is a site i love uh bitcoin is near all-time highs and the mainstream doesn't care yet the point being made here is that um and if you look at the orange line that's bitcoin over the last couple of years from a from the a mountain peak to another mountain peak the point being they're making is last time it was a mountain peak it was all consumers speculating like a bubble but this time google searches for bitcoin are at an all-time low and so this time it's driven by um it's driven by institutional investors buying into it which goes along with the sec chairman's point and you know now for those who don't know you can go to your stock trading uh, site of preference and type gbtc so btc for bitcoin and a g at the beginning there's a trust now that lets you buy a thousand shares of the trust are equal to one bitcoin and you can trade shares that are basically bitcoin um, and that trust has now grossed billions of dollars of inbound investment money over the last six months. So there's something gold-like about Bitcoin as a store of value. It's worth saying the dollar, by the way, is, 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 is seriously down against the pound and the euro in the last uh, month or so. And the predictions are that the dollar relative weight to the rest of the currencies in the world is going to decline. So for those of us who live in the US, dollar isn't a good place to keep our store of value. So you're saying Bitcoin is not the next WeWorks, it's real. Um, to be honest, that's an open question because Bitcoin is that real. If you're saying it isn't. You're saying you're just... No, no I, I'm not. I'm going to define the meaning of real. Uh, in, when, it, when it comes to stores of value, real is a function of human decisions to use something. And, and you can't predict human behavior, but if humans choose to use Bitcoin as a store of value, yes, it will be real. And what can go wrong? Um, What's the worst case scenario? To that could go our, wrong Russian, our Russian uh, student of, of Beatles, how could it destroy our civilization? Um, it, you know, it, it, it's a true globalizing store of value that kind of overrides the fiat currency nation state central bank structure so if you believe that the future is a harmonious human race that doesn't care about nations as depicted in let's say star trek then it's all good but if you believe that nation states are permanent and will defend their currencies against each other first and then uh, resist globalism then it's probably bad and, and Bitcoin isn't the only cryptocurrency. I mean, you have Ethereum, you have others. So, um, yeah, how, how are they doing? Uh, they they pretty much mirror Bitcoin. Uh, it's very rare for, although Ripple, which um, uh, is a, a slightly different animal, uh, Ripple did rise about fifty to sixty percent this week and then dropped down a little bit. So it it, it is performing differently than Bitcoin in the short term and in contrast are the banks in tr the traditional banks are they in trouble i think i distinguish between central banks and retail Not banks. The central banks the re but the retail I think re retail banks. retail banking is you know two nineteenth 19th century to be interesting so it's to like the newspapers yeah and we're back in 1996 is that fair it, i think it is fair i think i think it's inevitable that human uh, need to manage money and to read will be satisfied in some way, but the 19th century answer to those needs is probably not the same as the 21st century answer. And Keith, finally, because we got to end here, convince me as a fairly traditional consumer of why I would want to use Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of these cryptocurrencies in contrast either to cash or traditional bank rooted dollar value what, what's in it for me why would i want to waste my time doing this i i would compare it to your savings account rather than your cash and your bank well, why account. would i want to translate my savings account my retirement account into bitcoin Be because your retirement account 
um, it, it, it depends on the assets it's invested in. Think of Bitcoin as an asset, like a house or or or, um, or a stock. Yeah, but you have a house, so you can live in it. You can't live in a Bitcoin. Yeah, but you probably have some money somewhere that is just uh, designed to accrue value over time. Yeah, Bitcoin. and it's very secure. I have it through Merrill Lynch. It's my retirement fund. The last thing I want to do is gamble on, you know, 50 or 60 percent swing uh, valuation, you know, things that go up or down 50 percent in a week. Why would I want to do that? Well, well, the, the point of this uh, article is that that is probably in the rearview mirror. The Bitcoin is a lot more stable due to institutional adoption. Okay, but, okay, you're still not convincing me. Why would I want to switch into Bitcoin? Because it'll turn your money into more money faster than any other no, asset. So you're, you're arguing it's a speculative thing. No, 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 no more than gold is. So it's an alternative. If I if I don't want to buy gold and I don't want to buy, it's a network. I, I can explain it. It's a network effect. Um, the more people that choose it, the more valuable it becomes because it becomes a credible store of value. So well, that's there's what Adam Newman said about WeWorks and it didn't work out that way. The more real estate he bought up, the more valuable it no. is. And in the long run, it's not the out. same, not the same thing. That's that's cheeky. <laughs> Why is it cheeky? Well, because um, uh, buildings that you need to make a profit from renting out desks isn't a store of value. It's but Bitcoin is not unlimited. It requires physical mining of of, 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 of digital product. So it, it's not like... Um, it money. only requires physical mining until it gets to 21 million, and then there's no more mining. So you're confident it's not going to bring down Western civilization? It's just an asset. It's and what an percentage asset. of your assets lie in Bitcoin or Ethereum or any other crypto? Uh, about 10%. I wouldn't put wise, wise from Keith 10% I think is a maximum and that's entirely speculative well it, it's banking on uh, human adoption You're using that word the uh, banking uh, liberally right correct well good luck with Bitcoin Keith I will remind you that this time next week when Bitcoin crashes 80% you'll be that 10% of your of your worth will be 80% down and we will continue this conversation and many others have a great week and we will see you next week December 2020 we're crawling to the end of this dismal year and I think we're all happy with that thank you Mr Andrew Keane